Hello and welcome to the YouTube channel for CraftWorldEldar.com. I'm Brent, and this video is on Combat Patrol Play, or 500-point games of Warhammer 40k as a CraftWorlds player. If you are a longtime blog reader, if, if you are familiar with my website and, and have been going there for a while, uh, you may remember that around this time last year, I posted an article all about 500-point games called How to Assemble a Craft World's Combat Patrol. Uh, some of the information in this video will come directly from, from that. Uh, but I will also revise some of what I said earlier. The game has changed. There are new secondary missions, and the meta has changed, which affects what's good. Uh, and I, I, I'm also going to say some new things. So if you have read that guide, uh, this is not just a total rehash, even though when I start off it, it will sound very similar. For the busy horse dentists out there, um, who don't like long videos, head over my, to my website, go to the blog section, scroll down, find the article. You can get 85% of what I'm going to say uh, there. And if you check the description for this video, you will find an alternative suggestion for a 500 point list that is not the one that I mentioned in that original uh, article, but that is more up to date. And that, that version of the content will serve your purposes, I think. Okay, but the rest of you, uh, I'm going to talk about how 500 point play is different, why I personally love it, how the tactical and list construction elements of 500 point play are a bit different, and then I'll walk you through one possible list and, and how to think about building variants on that list. So here we go. If you haven't played any 500 point missions yet, I think you're missing out on one of the best ways to play 40K. These games are fast, surprisingly dynamic, and highly tactical. And I, I will admit, uh, when I started playing 500 points, back at the beginning of 9th Ed, I hadn't played since I was a kid uh, at the 500 point level. You know, when you first start playing 40K, maybe you play 500 points because that's what you have painted in your collection or not even painted. Uh, it's it's an easy way to get into the the game, and just in so far as it requires fewer resources. But I was worried, uh, as an adult player who could choose to play two thousand points, that five hundred point play would be a dice game. Right? We have so few models on the table that, and, and therefore we're roll, rolling so many fewer dice that maybe the averages don't work out in exactly the same way. And, and basically, we're just it's a game of craps. We're throwing dice, and it's and, and that's it. Uh, and, and it's not that way. That turns out to not be true, right? I, my, my other big concern was that it would be rock, paper, scissors, that because it's not possible at the 500-point level to build a list that can deal equally well or very well with every possible obstacle that we would have to specialize. And then, you know, if I show up with an anti-tank list and you have a bunch of gene stealers and gaunts while well, the game's over, or if I show up with an anti-tank list and you show up with two dreadnoughts, the game's over, right? It's... Um, Rock, paper, scissors, 40K. Neither of those things is true. If you are worried about that, you have nothing to worry about. 500-point play presents many of the same tactical considerations as a 2,000-point game, but it's so much faster. Here's the way in which it is very different. In big games of 40K, uh, your decisions matter, but you can afford, usually, some mistakes. In 500-point play... Every decision you make is critical, and small mistakes are completely catastrophic. So here's an example. When I first got back into 500-point uh, games, well, as, I wasn't really into them when I was young, so that's a misnomer. But when I first started playing 500 points at the beginning of 9th Ed, and uh, my second 500-point game, I think, or maybe it was my second night playing 500 points, doesn't matter, I was playing against a Custodes army with a Craft Worlds list, and on turn one, I moved my Shining Spears into position for a turn two charge, and I did a little math, and I worked out he didn't really have any shooting, so I didn't need to worry about keeping them out of line of sight, and I worked out that in order to reach my Spears, my opponent would need a 10-inch charge, and I figured that wasn't terribly probable, and what I was not thinking is that, of course, he will spend a CP on the reroll. It was just a play error, right? Um, he has so much riding on it. And your chances of getting to a 10 or better on 2d6 when you can roll them twice are twice <laughs> as good as when you're rolling them once. And so when I did my risk calculation, uh, I, I just I made, a, I made a bad choice. I, 
didn't do the right calculation. He, of course, succeeded on the roll, annihilated my unit, and at that point, the game was basically over. There's no, there no coming back from it. Uh, I love this about combat patrol games. Initially, I tell that story. It sounds a little bit shitty. You, know, you lose the game on turn one because of one bad move. But uh, the turns happen so rapidly that it, it doesn't really matter. The, you know, the game ends, you re-rack, you start again, you get to play four times. And so in, it, it's not that your, your evening is ruined or you've lost. You'll have another a bunch of opportunities to win. And I, I have fun even when I know I'm going to lose. But because the consequences for your decisions are so significant and so immediate, it's really easy to identify what works and what doesn't. 500-point games will make you a better player. They just will. I think, in fact, they are the most efficient way both to learn 40K and also to become better at 40K. Uh, here's another thing I love about 500-point play, and then I, I will shut up about this and, and start talking about how to do it. But the low number of units on the table makes it so easy to keep track of relevant stratagems and unit combos, and not just yours, but also your opponent's stratagems and unit combos, that uh, it, it's just not as mentally taxing. And for new players, it becomes possible, right? I think... Unless you're some sort of, I don't know, super genius uh, nanotech digital octopus designer, if you're new to 40K, trying to keep track of all of the unit synergies and the stratagems available to your 2,000-point list, maybe not only in your codex, but also in your Octarius book or your Phoenix Rising book, or what, it's just mind-melting and frankly not possible. And the game takes a long time and is exhausting. Um, 500 point games are not like that. You can, you go into the, the match knowing, you know, these five or six strategies are the only ones that I'm likely to use. And you can know which ones your opponent is likely to use too. Uh, and so even when both players are not 40 K experts, 500 point games have the intensity of a good chess match where you are making decisions based on knowing what your opponent is likely to do in the next two to three moves and what tricks she has up her sleeve. And that usually only happens in 2,000-point games when both players are veterans with encyclopedic knowledge of one another's units and are both very good players. So 500-point games make that sort of intense tactical version of 40K that's so much fun when you can play it much more accessible to a much wider variety of players. And that's great. It also cuts down on gotcha moments, right? You, you're... Your opponent doesn't get to pull out this powerful stratagem you didn't know was available to the army and make a, I don't know, a six-inch heroic intervention instead of a three-inch heroic intervention. And then I lost a tournament game that way once. I was so mad. Um, I just didn't know that his character could make a six-inch uh, heroic intervention. So 500-point games, they'll make you better. Uh, they're very exciting, and they give newer players access to a, a type of play and level of play that usually only comes with months or maybe even many years of experience. Okay. As you are thinking about playing 500-point games and, and how you build a list, uh, even though I said it has much of the same tactical complexity and richness as 2,000-point games, nevertheless, the principles of list construction are a bit different. So here's, here's number one. It's much more important in a 500-point list that you, you have units that can do multiple things well, right? So when you're playing at 2,000 points, it's fine to have units that are dedicated anti-tank and units that are, uh, you know, I don't know, dedicated tar pit unit. All they do is tie up other units and slow them down. But in a 500-point list, pretty much everything you include has to at least have the capacity to do at least two jobs well, or maybe more jobs well. And it is for this reason, I'm going to make my first bold claim of this video, that I think arguably Shining Spears are hands down the best Craft Worlds unit for 500 point play, especially with expert crafters and hunters of ancient relics. Because uh, if you give the Exarch the upgraded lance, they threaten, they, they can hit they can kill anything in the game, right? They, they're incredibly dangerous to heavy infantry, incredibly dangerous to monsters, incredibly dangerous to tanks. And they have, even three of them, have 12 shuriken shots, three spear shots, and then they can zip into combat. And if they're on an objective with 
uh, hundreds of ancient relics. They have 10 more melee attacks. So they wreck hordes, they wreck heavy infantry, they wreck tanks, they wreck individual characters. Because they are a threat to everything, uh, they play even better. They're already arguably the best, certainly one of the best cavalry units in the game at 2,000 points. At 500 point play, they're incredible. So units need to be able to do multiple jobs well. Spears, for us, I think, are the premier example of that. Principle two. So principle one is generalist units or units that do multiple things well. Principle two. Durable units are much more important in 500-point games. Having units that you are going to trade quickly, uh, it's just, I mean, trading units aren't a bad idea, but trading units are also units that are fragile when they're caught flat-footed. Uh, as in, so a unit of witches, for example. You might not be a Drakari player, but witches are quite tough if you can get them into melee because then they have a good invulm. When they're not in melee, uh, they just fold to fire, especially if they don't have their feel no pain yet save, which doesn't come until turn three for Drakari players. So uh, units that can survive a beating, so wraith blades with axes and shields, especially if you cast protect on them, that just shrug off incoming fire. Your opponent doesn't have enough shooting and their whole army to shift that unit. And so if all you do is give them units to shoot at that are incredibly costly to try to remove, uh, you force your opponent to choose between a couple of equally bad options. They, potentially, they can't really do anything to you at all. Um, in my most recent 500-point game, my, my last game of the evening last week, uh, I played against a Thousand Suns list. I lost three models, two Wraith Blades and uh, maybe a Scout. Um, so it being savvy when you when you pick units, and, and part of uh, part of that durability, right? Access to a feel no pain is amazing. Access to an invulm is amazing. Um, you, you and you need that. You need either the feel no pain or the invulm or both. Merely having something that's high toughness is not enough. There are a lot of weapons in the game which will blow up a high toughness model that that will fit. Then those weapons will fit in a five hundred point list, no problem. So when I say durability, um, I'm specifically talking about invuln saves and feel no pain saves. So that shining spear unit I was talking about just a moment ago, if you give the Exarch a uh, skilled rider, which gives them him, him at least, or her, a three-up invuln save against shooting, suddenly that shining spear squad, too, is enormously durable against the level of fire that somebody can bring to a 500-point game. Principle number three, monsters and vehicles that do not have declining profiles are, are more valuable at 500 points than they are at 2,000 points. They're great at 2,000 points, but a Wraith Seer, for example, which uh, it fights just as well with one wound as when it's undamaged, is enormously valuable. Uh, it's hard to fit a Wraith Seer into the list if you take the D cannon. It, in fact, 500, if you are bringing a Wraith Seer, 500-point play might be one of the rare circumstances in which it makes sense to have your Wraith Seer magnetized to be able to put a cheaper weapon on the shoulder. The D cannon's good. It's not necessarily a bad idea, but something like a Star Cannon uh, is not a terrible idea either. Uh, for Craft World players, that means War Walkers, right? Viper Jet Bikes uh, support platforms are actually quite tough and durable for the they have a lot of wounds at a pretty good durability relative to their point cost i know that they don't have an invuln i just said that durable units need to have some sort of invulnerable save or feel no pain to count but uh certainly something like a an indirect fire artillery weapon that's out of line of sight and only costs 50 points uh it might also be worth considering Principle number four, low movement values are less of a problem. So craft world uh, units are already pretty quick. That's one of our big advantages is we have access to a lot of fast units and units that can deep strike. Um, but suddenly units like the Avatar of Cain or those Wraith Blades with their five inch move, which struggle on a larger board, do really don't struggle as much when the board is small. There are only four objectives. Everybody needs to play for the ones in the middle of the table. Your unit of Wraith Blades with Ghost Axes and Shields, if you use matchless agility on turn one to guarantee that they move 11 inches, can be anywhere they need to be on turn two. It's just, it's fine. 
it's absolutely fine. Uh, you hear a theme developing here. Wraith blades are a, a unit of wraith blades with protect, and and those shields are fabulous in five hundred point games. Uh, the only drawback, right, to, to some of these sort of slower lum lumbering units is that maneuverability issue. It does that curiously as a craft worlds player, this does raise a problem that you might not encounter as much in in two thousand point play, which is your opponent's slow moving dangerous lumbering models uh, are harder to just outmaneuver and ignore. So, for example, against Death Guard, at 2,000 points, the way to play Death Guard is to, to just deny them engagement um, and, and shoot the crap out of them. But at 500 points, uh, you are going to have to tank. Luckily, Death Guard units are so expensive. They struggle at 500 points simply because um, you can't fit very many in a list. But but you may you may find yourself not as able to avoid uh, an, an opponent's units as, as you might otherwise be able to. Um, so that is that's a drawback. It's something to consider. But your own slow units are more powerful. Uh, number five, principle number five: deep strikers are way better. Um, they're they're so good in two thousand point games. Deep strike is so good. But in in five hundred point play, it's even better, and that's because. You're, even though the table is smaller, uh, the table's half as large as for 2,000-point play, but you only have 25% of the models. And so if you do some quick math here, a player's ability to control his or her or their backfield is significantly less in 500-point games than what it is in 2,000-point play. And there's your, your opponent cannot afford not to contest the midfield so they have to be moving units into the midfield. They probably don't have very many units. Their own backfield is likely to be exposed. And so all of these craft worlds units with free deep strike abilities uh, probably have a lot more options for deployment than they would in 2,000 uh, point games. So deep strikers, you absolutely want to make room for deep strikers in your list or have a uh, webway portal in your pocket even something like a unit of Dire Avengers can do some real work for you. Okay, here's my last thing. Oh, one more thing about um, Deep Strikers and threatening the backfield. I'm going to talk about this later, but I think uh, threatening the backfield in 500-point games, it's so much better than it is in 2,000 points because let's say uh, you drop a unit of Rangers into your opponent's backfield. Rangers do have some play, by the way, at 500 points, so be glad to know. They really have a tough time right now in the game. But you drop your, some Rangers into, out of line of sight in your opponent's backfield, and you have the secondary objective uh, behind enemy lines. So you, just by virtue of having them back there, you're scoring. They can potentially move, move out, blast something with their long rifles, and then fire and fade out of line of sight, or they just uh, keep their heads down and score. In order to deal with that... 65 point unit your opponent has to take another unit that would have been moving forward towards the midfield threatening the midfield or contesting midfield objectives and move them into position to attack those rangers so it's probably going to take them out of the game for one probably two turns which is huge and so you can make essentially what you're doing is a trade you're trading if, if they ignore your rangers you score if they don't ignore your rangers you're trading your rangers for eliminating a more expensive, more powerful, more important unit for two turns and preventing it from contesting a midfield objective. Pressure on your opponent's backfield limits your opponent's ability to play the midfield, which is likely where the game will be won. Deep strikers are so good. Last thing. Secondary objectives in 500-point play uh, are certainly just as critical as they are in 2,000-point games but the secondary objectives that will work for you are going to be different. For example, Engage on All Fronts is almost, for a 2,000-point Craft Worlds list, Engage on All Fronts in competitive play is basically a requirement. At 500 points, uh, the, what few units you have likely need to be in very particular places each turn in order to contest primary objectives while remaining alive or to stay alive themselves or to be able to target an enemy unit. And so trying to also have them appropriately positioned to score engage on all fronts 
is pretty damn hard. And as soon as you lose one or two units, you won't be able to max out the score for that anyway. Uh, you don't want engage on all fronts in 500 point games. Also, by that same token, um, Oct Octarius data, that can work for you. It's, uh, it can be tricky um, because it requires, in order to max the score for Octarius data, you require infantry units four turns in which an infantry unit does nothing but score the objective those that action economy objective scoring uh you have to think much harder about whether you can spare an infantry unit's participation in the battle in order to trigger a secondary it doesn't mean you shouldn't do it octarius data can still be very powerful at 500 points if you have a single unit of say uh dire avengers that on turn one moves on to a out of out of line of sight backfield objective scores it performs octarius data and then you have unit of swooping hawks the deep strikes turn two out of line of sight scores it then moves and scores it again um your hawks potentially can still participate in the battle on turn five and and ma help you max out your score but it you see how this works right i mean there's a there's a significant a significantly greater proportional cost to trying to max your score for something like, like Octarius Data, any action economy secondary, uh, those actions are much more precious than they are in 2,000-point play. Again, it doesn't mean you shouldn't do it, but it's something to think about. In contrast, some of the, the secondary objectives, which were really not viable in 2,000-point games or rarely viable, are suddenly much better in 500 point games. So I already mentioned behind enemy lines. That one is freaking great. Uh, the, so if you don't know how this works, it's changed a little bit since uh, the 2020 Grand Tournament Mission Pack, and it's different from the core book, but the current behind enemy lines rules work like this. You score two points at the end of your turn if you have one unit wholly within your opponent's deployment zone. You score four victory points if you have two units wholly within your opponent's deployment zone at the end of your turn. Um, a lot of your craft world's units, and in fact, what, something like a unit of Shining Spears that likes to get in your opponent's face, something like a unit of Rangers that deep strikes into the backfield can keep its head down and help you to get to four instead of two. It's very easy to, to score this while your units are doing other things, while they're participating in the battle, uh, while they're shooting enemy units, controlling objectives, contesting objectives. So I said early on that one of the key principles of 500-point play is that every individual unit needs to be able to use do multiple jobs. A 2,000-point play, you can have specialists that only do one thing. You can't do that in 500-point games. Uh, and behind enemy lines lets you do that really effectively. It also has great synergy with a secondary objective that I never run in 2,000-point games, and that is... Uh, pierce the veil so here's how pierce the veil works it's uh a, it's a psychic action that can only be therefore can only be performed by a psyker who has to be within six inches of an opponent's battlefield edge which note is not the same thing as an opponent's deployment zone so in in for example circumstances in which uh deployment zones are diagonal on the table you could be next to your opponent's battlefield edge but not necessarily in your opponent's deployment zone uh, psychic actions obviously take the place of psychic powers, so a unit that's performing a psychic action cannot perform other psychic powers. Okay, but but it's enormously valuable. Uh, if you can pull this off twice with its warp charge value of four, you score eight points. If you can pull it off four times, you can score 15 points. And this means that if, let's say I have a, Let's say I put a 50-point foot warlock into my list, and I started off in deep strike uh, with the stratagem that lets you do this with an infantry unit. And on turn two, my warlock pops out in my opponent's backfield. Uh, if my opponent were to just completely ignore it for the entire game, and I just kept scoring this warp charge value four thing, that would give me 15 points. If, however, my opponent interferes with me at some point, say they are able to deny the witch once or twice, I still score eight, which in 500 points is pretty good. Uh, or if they manage to chase my psyker down and kill him, okay, but I bet I can get to, I bet I can get this twice, especially if I put him on a jet bike. I wouldn't do this with a footlock 
you, you put them on a jet bike. Uh, you can still probably pull this off twice. And then in order to like hunt him down, you can give him the Phoenix gem, right? Which can make him irritatingly difficult to kill. Uh, in order to hunt him down, your opponent is diverting resources away from the midfield, which is where the real battle is happening. If you have uh, both a warlock on a jet bike and also a unit of scouts taking up your troop slot, deep striking into your opponent's backfield, now that warlock is doing two things for you. He's both uh, scoring you points for Pierce the Veil, and he's helping you go from two to four points uh, for behind enemy lines. And at that point, I said, you know, units have to be able to do more than one thing. Well, scoring is one thing, but if you're scoring for two different secondaries and potentially at the end of the game, that one unit ends up being worth uh, something like 30 points or even, I don't know, 26 or something or 22, that's absolutely worth 10% of the points in your list. That's fabulous. So that's a, again, that's a secondary I never pick in 2000 point games. But in 500-point play, it's so hard to control your own backfield that it can be really good. In fact, I think we give GW too hard a time for uh, the, the imbalance in the quality of the secondary missions because they did give us four different ways to play the game. Uh, well, I guess three. I guess 1,500-point play is not a real thing. And ne neither really is 3,000-point play. But uh, some of the secondaries are that aren't good in high point value play are really great in small point value play. Another one to consider is um, psychic interrogation. Uh, it's you need to be within twenty four inches. It's a psychic action. You need to be within twenty four inches of a visible enemy character model and succeed. Warp charge value four. Now, if your opponent has any psychers, yes, they'll have an opportunity to deny this. But look at it this way. You, you probably if you're going to do any sort of warpcraft objectives and i actually really like them in 500 point games you need two psychers in your list because you need a psyker who's going to cast some psychic power like protect and then you also need a psyker who is devoted to performing psychic actions at least three or four turns of the game uh if your opponent attempts to deny and succeeds at denying your 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 scoring cast that probably means they won't attempt to deny protect and so that's its own kind of win this is the principle of 40k by which you try to give your opponent bad choices. Any choice you make is a bad choice. Either you have to let my Wraith Blades have a 3-up and vulnerable save, or you have to try to prevent me from scoring these points. You don't want me to do either of those things. I'm probably going to get to do at least one of them. Another advantage to Psychic Interrogation over Pierce the Veil is that uh, you... You don't have to succeed an even number of times, right? If, if you pierce the veil once, it's worth nothing. If you do it three times, it's the same as two times. So every time you perform psychic in, uh, interrogation, it's worth three points. So in theory, if you did it every turn, you could get to 15. Um, in that sense, it's great. Uh, it might sound objectively better than pierce the veil, but I do like the synergy that pierce the veil has with behind enemy lines. They're both distinct possibilities. They both necessitate you taking a second psyker in your list. Uh, before I talk about the other secondary that I really like, I'm going to talk about the ones that I don't. Um, I think that all of the Killy secondaries are kind of traps in 500 point play. Uh, your opponent just isn't going to have enough infantry models on the table, probably, to make no prisoners worth it. Um, I think you want to be able to get more than five points on each of your secondaries, and at least a couple of those. You want to be getting pretty darn close to 15, and that's just not happening in, at, in a 500-point game. Similar, similarly, uh, bring it down. Your opponent is not going to have enough monsters and vehicles. Uh, Titan Hunter is completely not an option. The only grind them down might sound tempting. I really think it's a total trap, unless your opponent is running like I don't know, nine units, or you couldn't even, eight units of 50 Gaunts or something, Tyranid player. Um, there's just no guarantee that you're going to be able to consistently destroy more units than than your opponent does. Uh, the dice are too fickle in low point value games. The only one that maybe, maybe is seriously worth considering is Assassination. If your opponent has two characters, one of them is the Warlord, you kill them worth both at seven points. That's like the minimum, I think, that you could... And so there might be lists against which that makes sense. 
But in general, if you're like me, 2,000 points, you often make your third objective a killy objective tailored to your opponent's list. I think that's really not going to work as well for you here. On the other hand, uh, to the last, fabulous. So to the last gives you five points at the end of the game for each of your uh, three most expensive units if those units survive. So if, for example, you had uh, a unit of Wraith Blades and a unit of Shining Spears um, and you had a unit of Scouts and you put a sixth Scout into that unit, I pull this sometimes, uh, potentially if any of the Scouts and any of the Shining Spears are alive, at the end of the battle, and at least one of those incredibly hard to kill wraith blades, that's 15 points. Um, and people sometimes talk about win more uh, moves. So if you're not familiar with the concept of a win more move, um, in list building, sometimes you'll hear very experienced players criticize certain decisions as a win more decision. That is, you've included this thing in your roster, and yes, it's cool, yes, it will help you, but the circumstances in which that model ends up doing its job are circumstances in which you are going to win the game anyway, so it doesn't matter. That's a win-more model. Uh, the Harlequin Solitaire has been accused of being a win-more model. Um, I actually, one of the things I like about Grind Them Down is that I think that when you lose with it, it's actually a lose-more pick. And lose-more is fine, right? If I was going to lose anyway, I don't really care if this is not working for me, but it could make the difference, right? In, in a game in which I don't get tabled, when I have any models left at the end, and I usually do, I think as a Craft Worlds player, you're not terribly likely to get tabled in 500 point games. Uh, you can probably pull off 10 points at the end of the game and you don't have to do anything special, right? Like maybe in turn four or five, you fly away with your last Shining Spear instead of doing a suicide run against his remaining character because it's fun, right? Um, that one is, I think, just much easier for us at the 500 point level to make work. So the takeaway here is not that you have to use the secondary objectives that I like, uh, but you do probably need to seriously reconsider how it is you are you are playing your secondary objectives. Okay. Uh, lastly, I wanna talk about what units are best for us at the 500 point level. Um, and, and I do think, so, if you were to, if you were to go to my website, you you know that I have. You may have already seen my strategy guide about building craft world lists, and I say in that that uh, there are a series of questions that every player needs to be able to answer when she assembles a list. Right? How will my army score primary objectives? How am I going to play that primary objective game? Right? How will my objective? My home, how will my army play the secondary objective game? How am I going to deal with? Uh, enemy tanks, monsters, hordes, and so on, right? They're all of these concerns. At the 500 point level, it's exactly the same set of questions and what units are good are the ones that provide the best answers to those questions. So question number one, how will my army play the primary objective game? Honestly, it's really not that different at 500 points than it is at 2000 points. If you've already watched my video on how to play the primary objective game, you've already seen all of my suggestions concerning which units do this well but wraith blades with axes and shields buffed with protect you will not at the 500 point play probably also have the points to put fortune on them um but protect is probably good enough that's a great option if you are going to build a list with Asserman, dire avengers are a possibility i think it's a very expensive build uh Asserman some Dire Avengers, you need Protect on them with a Warlock, and you probably need uh, Superior Shurikens, Hail of Doom, and um, uh, what do you call it? The Oh, sorry, guys. I don't know. Superior Shurikens, Hail of Doom. They have to have the three plus Invalm. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, Avenging Strike, right? That gives them plus one to hit and plus one to wound once they've lost... A model you really need that build i think in order for that to be a, a potent objective holder and that's most of your your points at 500 so that one is a more mar marginal pick you can make it work small units of, di of dire avengers making use of battle fortune are okay um a unit of 
uh, Storm Guardians at 56 points. That's using that's staying out of melee range, making use of um, uh, Celestial Shield and maybe has Protect on it. That's also a, a pretty good option. Your Wraith Blades with Axes don't have Obsec, and so you might end up in a situation where they're sort of they're swamped with enemy models and. You know, I in my last game they were fighting uh, ten rubric marines in melee, and the rubric marines had obsec, and so you end up losing that objective. But nevertheless, they're such a powerful, durable melee bully unit that the resources your opponent has to commit to tying them up on that objective and taking it from you will probably create a situation where you can take other objectives away from your opponent, and it ends up being okay. Um, so. Wraith Blades with Axes and Shields uh, and a Spirit Seer running with them to cast Protect on them to give them a 3-up and uh, Invuln uh, and also allow them to reroll ones to hit. If they also have Expert Crafters, that's a reroll of a 2 to hit, so they're rerolling all their 2s and at least 1-1. One, one. Um, or 3, because those Axes are minus 1 to hit with, which is very frustrating. Hopefully that will be addressed in the Codex. Uh... And the additional attacks that they get with Hunters of Ancient Relics makes it such that they're a, they're a potent melee threat. They can even deal with uh, hoardier units, right? One of the issues with Wraith Blades before we had access to Hunters of Ancient Relics was that they just couldn't kill, like, Hormigans. Um, but now they're okay at it because they fight on both players' turns. Uh, that's a really powerful choice. It's a really good unit. The Spirit Seer is a great option as... A warlord um and those those guardian units with uh with protect and celestial shield they have they really have um some value also uh how will my opponent score secondaries well i've already been talking about the secondaries that i think are most effective at 500 points so you just have to make sure you're including units in your army that can do those things right so if you require getting into your opponent's backfield you need to either have cp set aside to deep strike your unit of Dire Avengers that are using up your troop slot, or instead of your Dire Avengers, maybe you put some scouts in, they can deep strike in for free. If you want to attempt some sort of psychic interrogation, well, you have to make room for a second psyker. Uh, these are, you know, these are concerns. Um, what units are good are going to be what units best do those jobs. There is some room here with something like Behind Enemy Lines at 500 points to get use out of Striking Scorpions. I shudder to say it because they are so not good in so many ways, but uh, they're really cheap. They have an Exarch power that increases their durability. They do have a 3-up armor save, and you can just sort of hide them. They have that uh, CP-free Deep Strike, and they potentially can help you uh, score those, those secondaries in your opponent's backfield. I think you're better off taking a unit of scouts because they eat up the troops a lot and uh points are so precious it's but if you really want to use your scorpions it's it's something that you could do i've already said that i think that um shining spears are the single best option at 500 points because they can threaten anything on the board but a lot of your other build considerations will be about uh how you're going to prevent your opponent from doing the things that they want to do and the most efficient way to do that is to kill their units shining spears great for any sort of killing. Other pretty good options include individual war walkers with uh, star cannons, or maybe one bright lance and one star cannon with expert crafters. Uh, because of the, the, the reroll economy on those, they're, they're hitting above their pay grade. They don't have a declining profile. They have a five up invuln save. You can easily fit a war walker in a 500 point list. It can do some work for you. If you've got Shining Spears also, and you're planning to use the Shining Spears to deal with hard targets, it isn't the absolute worst idea to consider a Warwalker with a pair of scatter lasers that hovers in your own backfield, and it uses Fire and Fade to step off of an objective, light up opponent's light infantry at strength six, and then Fire and Fade back onto the objective. Uh, in the right list, that might actually be the best build for a war, war walker um i the, the viper is pretty good it doesn't have a declining profile um which is nice and with expert crafters it rerolls basically everything but i do think that honestly war walkers are much better than vipers at 500 points for the simple reason that the board is small the uh speed of the viper counts for less you're not probably going for engage on all fronts which is one of the big uses of the viper in 2000 point play um but it's another 
it's another option available to you as a pretty cheap tank with a well vehicle without a declining profile. Um, you do need to consider what you're going to do if your opponent brings so some sort of incredibly powerful aggressive melee bullet unit. And this is one of the reasons that I think that it is so valuable having those uh, wraith guard in the, or um, wraith blades in the list with the shields. Because if your opponent has something like custodies or aggressive terminator units or something that just cleans up in hand to hand combat, um, especially if they can do that, and, and, and it's something that's pretty tough, and they can do that on both midfield objectives, you can't afford to hang back shooting that for three turns uh, to then to tr try to swoop in and score at the end of the game um, on turn four. It, your opponent, If your opponent controls more objectives than you do, your opponent scores 15 points. If, you're, if you control at least two in these 500-point matchups, you're scoring 10. So if if you can keep your opponent, if you can hold two objectives and shoot your opponent off a third, you score 15 and your opponent scores five. If you can do that for two turns, you pretty much win the game. But similarly, if your opponent can do that to you for two turns, you're pretty much effed. So if you don't have something that can get in there against a melee bully unit in the mid game, you're very likely to lose the game if you come up against that build. It doesn't have to be Wraith Blades. You could, for example, use a Wraith Seer, that Ghost Glaive that he carries, D3 plus 3 damage, 4 attacks, 5 with Hunters of Ancient Relics, plus rerolls if you take Expert Crafters, and if you cast Witch Strike on him, uh, it actually does D3 plus 5. I would not recommend taking Witch Strike. You should just take Smite and 500 points. But I love reminding people that it exists because he it makes him the hard... It, he hits harder than the Wraith Knight, which I, I just love the delicious irony of that with that Titanic Ghost Glaive. Um, so you, you do need a way to play... Uh, the midfield, if your opponent has a, a, a tough melee bully unit, you might be able to just do it with Shining Spears. I have not found this to be super successful in my own play, but these are your considerations. The units that are good are the units that give you answers to those questions. How will I score primaries? How will I score secondaries? How will I destroy the various types of units my opponent might bring? Uh, Shining Spears are great for this. Wraith Blades are great for this. Uh, the Wraith Seer is okay. Warwalkers fabulous your um uh the psychers are of course essential for buffs and also potentially scoring scoring psychic secondaries a unit of rangers can be really helpful for those board control secondaries uh these are all just great picks now there are a lot of ways to build a list at 500 points uh there are ways to bring a farseer and a warlock and try to rely on some psychic brutality. It involves making a lot of hard choices. Uh, you could even try bringing something pretty expensive, like a lynx, which your opponent might not be able to deal with, especially if you fire and fade it. Uh, so I'm not suggesting that the, uh, the units that I have mentioned in this video are, are necessarily the, the only units that are highly effective at 500 points, but I do think that they will do good work for you. To finish up, I'm going to run you through a list that's been working well for me recently in 500 point play. I don't usually share lists. I prefer to talk about the principles of good list building and tactical decision making at the table, but I'm making an exception. I think 500 point play is particularly appealing for newer players. Uh, maybe this is hypocritical. I'm doing it. Here we go. Uh, so it's a, it's a combat patrol detachment. It's a patrol detachment. It's a custom craft world, Ibrisil, with uh, Hunters of Ancient Relics, which provides an extra attack per model to units that are on an objective. And they don't have to be wholly with on an objective. They merely have to be touching the objective, some model in the unit. And then Expert Crafters, which of course allows one reroll to hit and one reroll to wound in both the shooting and in the fight phase. The Warlord is a Spirit Seer with Protect, Jinx, and Smite, and he has the Warlord Power Seer of the Shifting Vector, which provides one free reroll per turn on something. Uh, and his job is to run around with a unit of Wraith Blades. I'll talk about them shortly. I'll, my second HQ is a Warlock Skyrunner who has a Crushing Orb and 
Protect Jinx. You may be wondering why I take Protect Jinx on both. Well, normally the Warlock Skyrunner is performing Psychic Secondaries, but in the rare event that he doesn't need to do that and he's not using his Crushing Orb power, uh, which, by the way, is the... The runes of battle power that replaces smite. So warlock smite is bad because it's it's one damage. They don't do D three; they do one. It's baby smite. So you're much better off swapping it out for a runes of battle power. Crushing orb uh, does it. It's it's kind of like smite. It's only for characters. You roll three D six, and for every five or better, you roll it does a mortal wound. Um, I don't know that that's really the best pick. Usually he's performing psychic, but every now and then it's. Well, I'll explain why in a minute. So his job is to perform psychic secondaries. If I come up against a list that is uh, predominantly... It, if I come up against a list with a strong backfield and I don't think I can deep strike, strike him into the backfield for Pierce the Veil, I'll choose Psychic Interrogation. Uh, if the backfield is looking particularly scrumptious, I choose uh, Pierce the Veil. His job first and foremost, is to score points for Psychic Secondaries. But there will be one or two turns of the game when maybe he does something else. Uh, my Spirit Seer is pretty much always casting Protect on my Wraith Blades, except in very rare circumstances in which he might cast Jinx or Smite. There might be rare circumstances against something like a Custodes list in which I need my Warlock to Jinx a unit with 3-up invuln save for a turn, so my Shining Spears or my Wraith Blades can eliminate that unit. So he has Protect Jinx, even though it's redundant with the Spirit Seer. And in case you're wondering, those are different powers. So it is specifically addressed in the Codex. You can have one Psyker cast Protect and another Psyker cast Jinx the same turn. They are different powers. So that's the second HQ unit. He also has the uh, Phoenix Gem, which is a relic that when... The character carrying it is killed. Uh, you roll a d6 on a two up. Units within uh, nearby units take d3 mortal wounds, and as long as you deal some mortal wounds, your um, psyker can come back with one wound remaining. And so he also has the opportunity to essentially go, uh, I guess, kamikaze on some enemy unit, be killed, do mortal wounds, come back, hit them again. It's also a deterrent if somebody is trying to take him out of the game, right? If they're if they're moving uh, units away from the midfield in order to eliminate him, the Phoenix Gem gives him extra durability, helps him stay in the game and continue to be a thorn in my opponent's side. My troops unit is a unit of rangers. Now, this was originally, I had uh, Dire Avengers in this list. Uh, they're a little bit cheaper, and arguably objectively better, but here, here's why I'm here's why I'm using Rangers. The, uh, the you only have three CP in 500 point play, and so I've already I'm already spending one CP to deep strike in my um, Warlock when when I'm doing Pierce the Veil. So I have to be prepared to do that. So I, I'm already at a CP deficit. The free deep strike on the Rangers is nice. I have six Rangers in this unit. For two reasons, one is uh, for my sec. Well, actually, one is for my secondaries. One is because I want them to be one of the most expensive units for the purposes of uh, while we stand, we fight, which is now called to the last. Uh, my other reason for having six rangers is that I had fifteen points left over, um, but the rangers deep strike into my opponent's backfield, and. They help me score. They don't have to perform actions to do it. They help me score behind enemy lines, which gives me uh, a couple of points for having a unit in my opponent's deployment zone towards, you know, towards their backfield. If my rangers fight, uh, I have six of them with expert crafters, which provides a reroll. So their chances of putting at least one mortal wound on a character is pretty good. And this actually has really good synergy. If I need to stop doing Pierce the Veil with my Warlock to kill a character... My Warlock can do Crushing Orb, and my six Rangers can all fire with Expert Crafters, and I stand a pretty reasonable chance of putting some Mortal Wounds on a character. And the sorts of cheap characters that people tend to bring to 500-point games can be enormously vulnerable to that sort of sniper activity. So if, if you need to take out some three- or four-wound character that's buffing your opponent's units, this can be a really efficient way to do that. Uh, the Rangers can potentially pop out, shoot something, fire and fade back out of sight, 
and help me continue to score secondaries. In a game in which there's no room in my opponent's backfield, maybe I use the Rangers to hold an objective in my own backfield. That has, I think, only ever happened once. Uh, but the Warlock and the Rangers, they have some flexibility. He also has some shots with the Shirk and Catapult. Um, his Witchblade is okay in melee, so they can do, they're there to help score, but they can also do other things for me when I need them to. I have a unit of five Wraith Blades with Ghost Axes and Shields. They run with the Spirit Seer. Turn one, I use Matchless Agility. The Spirit Seer makes an advanced move. The Wraith Blades uh, make an advanced move at 11. They're guaranteed with Matchless Agility to seize a midfield objective. Um, usually I can do this by moving straight through a breachable ruin so they can deploy out of line of sight and still grab a midfield objective on the first turn. If not, they can definitely get it on turn two. One advantage to getting it on turn two is my opponent has probably already moved on to it, and when we Wraith Blades charge, they get plus one to their attacks. So uh, they get an additional attack for Hunters of Ancient Relics for being on the objective, and then an additional one for the charge, and that ends up being win-win two if, if uh, my opponent gets to the objective first. Uh, the final unit in the list is a unit of Shining Spears in the fast attack slot. The Exarch has the upgraded Lance, so um, with six Rangers, this is coming in at 498 points with that upgraded Lance. The, uh, so the, the Shining Spears are my catch-all target elimination unit. Everything else in my... So my, my Wraith Blades are there to hold objectives. Yes, they're pretty decent at killing. My Spirit Seer is there to buff them and keep them in the game and help them be a melee tar pit and provide them with rerolls to hit. My uh, Rangers and my Warlock are utility units that are focused on scoring, and all of those units can also fight okay. But the Shining Spears are a dedicated murder unit. Um, that said, they also score. On turn one, typically, if my Shining Spears and my Warlock are in deep strike, the Spears grab the objective in my own backfield, and in 500-point play, you continue to, generally, and for most of the missions, it will say in the mission, you continue to control an objective the missions that are designed for 500 points in the core book uh, are the ones that I'm talking about here. The chapter-approved 2021 mission pack doesn't have any dedicated missions for 500-point play, which I actually think is kind of a shame. I think they should support 500-point play more aggressively. Um, but the ones in the core book are really good. And so the Shining Spears can grab that objective on turn one. The Exarch has the Exarch power uh, skilled rider, so he has a three-up invulm. And that's really enough to make them robust against... I try to keep them out of line of sight on turn one, but it's enough to keep to make them robust if I really need them to be. Sometimes, if an opponent puts serious firepower turn one on either the Wraith Blades or the Spears and I'm at all worried, I will pop lightning fast uh, to make the minus one to hit. That's a Two CP is huge. It's a huge expenditure in a 500-point game, but sometimes it can really make the difference on turn one in order to help you keep the edge. But that's a hard call whether or not to spend those points. So the Spears after turn one generally are in position to move pretty close to something, shoot it with the catapults and the Spears and charge it. And if they're on an objective, they're at they're each at plus one attack. So then they have 10 attacks in melee. Uh, they wound pretty much everything on either a three or a two up with minus four AP flat two damage. So they're going through any armor really that's not an invulm. Uh, they're just freaking monsters in small point value games. Very little. Your opponent probably doesn't have a lot that can deal with them. So if you think about what this looks like on turn one, after I move on turn one, uh, I probably have two objectives, one with my uh, Wraith Blades, one with my Spears. My Spirit Seer is protected by Lookout Sir. He's with the Wraith Blades. My Spears have Expert Rider. So both my Spears and my Wraith Blades with Protect have a 3-up and Vulnerable save, and I have access to minus 1 to hit. So even though Craft Worlds are not famously durable, they can have durability. And one advantage at low point value play is uh, this thing that Craft Worlds can do where they can make one unit, one or two units very durable or one unit very vulnerable with something like Doom or Jinx. Well, you only have a couple of units in play, really, at any given time, and your opponent only has probably one or two heavy hitters. So... The ability to buff or debuff a single unit really does have exponential value in small point value games. So that's it. That's uh, that's the list I've been playing around with. Again, if you go to my website, you can find an Oh, secondaries. So I'm typically taking uh, either, I mentioned, Pierce the Veil or Psychic Interrogation. We know how that works. I'm taking Behind Enemy Lines, probably. 
Uh, so with the scouts and the deep striking warlock, we know how that works. Uh, and then I'm taking to the last. And the way the points play out, that ends up being my scouts, my shining spears, and my warlocks. And it's pretty easy to keep at least two of those alive until the end of the game and score 10 points. I actually have often scored 15 with it, and I don't have to do anything extra or special to do that, which is great. And I said before, I think of this as kind of a lose more power. The circumstance in which you score no points on this is the circumstance in which you got tabled, and you were probably going to lose anyway. Um, so it doesn't, you know, at that point, whatever. Uh, I think this is a great sleeper pick for Eldar in small point value games. But if you want to see what this list looks like without the Rangers, uh, without the second Warlock, with some... Um, I'm sorry, Dire Avengers, and also a Warwalker for a little extra support. You can see that uh, over on my website on the blog post from about a year ago, How to Assemble a Craft Worlds Combat Patrol. If you have your own combat patrol lists that you would like to share, or thoughts on any aspect of this video, or uh, you just want to click like on the video, or perhaps follow the page or the, the channel, I would be delighted. Uh, it's been delightful talking to you about combat patrols. I love them so much. I look forward to seeing you next time. I hope the next video will be sooner. I'd like to close the intervals a bit. Uh, and I look forward to seeing your lists in the comments below. Thanks, guys. That's it.